Hello everyone. In this video, we talk about the basics of neural networks and deep learning, and also discuss one of the most important deep learning libraries and frameworks known as TensorFlow developed by Google. So let's get it started with the basic definition of neural networks. You can think of neural networks as computational models that they are motivated by the human brain's structure and functionality. They're designed to recognize patterns and solve complex problems in various domains, from autonomous driving to robotics to medical imaging and so on. Unlike simpler linear models that we have seen so far, such as linear regression and logistic regression, which they directly map input features to outputs, meaning that they usually form a weighted sum or combination of input features that are given to us, Neural networks introduce what is known as hidden layers between inputs and outputs, and therefore they provide much more uh, greater expressive power. In order to understand the basis of neural networks, I'd like to start with a very simple example. In this case, we create a one-dimensional synthetic data set, which means that we have one input feature and one output. And we assume that the input-output relationship is provided by a polynomial degree of 2 using this very simple equation. So meaning that here you have an input x, you plug in it into this equation, you find the corresponding output, and a and b and c are constants. Based on the previous lectures that we have, we know that we can use polynomial regression to solve this problem, meaning that we can define a pip pipeline use polynomial features, and uh, after that, apply a linear regression to transform features and solve this problem. However, a big challenge there is that you have to directly enforce the degree of polynomial. So what we really want to do here is that can we have a more uh, adaptive approach to solve this problem where we just uh, provide a hidden layer and then the hidden layer can magically extract this input-output relationship. And once we create this data set, we are going to talk about the, um, the uh, TensorFlow, which is a deep, very popular deep learning framework designed by Google. And um, TensorFlow is, can be a little bit complex uh, for, for beginners. Therefore, uh, there is another uh, high-level API or application programming interface which runs on top of TensorFlow known as Keras. So therefore, Keras and TensorFlow very much are you know, related, but Keras is much simpler and I can say it's you know, um, low code or high level in, in that sense, meaning that you don't have to know all the specific uh, details that uh, you need if you wanna directly use TensorFlow. But once you get to you know one of these two, usually it's easy to um, use the other one or also other uh, popular deep learning uh, libraries such as PyTorch, which that one is um, designed by Facebook. So in this very, uh, example that we have, so we're going to start importing libraries that we know. So we import NumPy as NP for, for arrays that we want to create. We import Matplotlib. We import terrain test split from scikit-learn. And these are these three parameters that we just discussed, A, B, and C. Uh, and then very similar to what we did before, we create a set of uh, equally spaced data points here from negative 10 to 10. And we have 400 of them, and we plug in it into this uh, quadratic form. And of course, we can add a little bit of noise. Here we use like a normal or Gaussian noise to make this problem a little bit more interesting. And once you create your data, as we said, usually you want to use train test split uh, to divide the data into training and testing sets. And this is the size of the testing set, which is 20% of the entire data. And then as we um, have seen this before, it's always a good idea to work with um, 2D input arrays, even though they are technically 1D, because uh, the way that, you know, scikit-learn and Keras, they, they look at these, uh, especially inputs, is that it should be a 2D array, where the number of rows is the number of samples, the number of columns is the number of features. So even if you have one column, we wanna make sure that it's actually a 2D array with one column. And that's what, this is exactly here for this dot reshape. 
And then we can plot this data using a scatter plots. So you can see that here we have our training data and we have our testing data, and this is indeed a, a, a quadratic form. So the part that is very important is about using, um, you know, Keras to define a neural network. So you can see here the architecture of a very simple neural network. So you have this input layer, very similar to what we did with linear and logistic regression. You're going to have some weights um, to, to connect this neuron or this input to this hidden layer that we have here, to these neurons in this hidden layer. And in this case, we are choosing five neurons, but this is usually one of the most important things that we have to decide how many neurons we want in a hidden layer. And in this case, we're going to find, you know, a, a weighted sum or linear combination of, uh, of the input. But what is really different uh, from the perspective of neural networks is that you can also apply a nonlinear function, which we call this usually an activation function, because you can think of this as, you know, neurons that they activate that they pass this information now to the next layer. And in this case, because we only have one hidden layer, the next layer is just the output layer, what we are trying to predict. And as we said, the basics of training neural networks is what we already know. So we have to have a loss function, where the loss function measures the disagreement between true and predicted outputs. And then we need to have a way of optimizing this loss function, and in this case means that we have to minimize it and find weights, or in this case, connections that uh, will uh, lead to the, the, the minimum value of the loss function. Okay, so without further ado, let's start uh, defining this model. So we're going to use, as I said, TensorFlow. It's uh, common to import TensorFlow as TF. And then from TensorFlow, we import Keras. And then inside Keras, we have these uh, modules where we have like models, like different ways of defining models. In this case, because we have like a sequential model, these layers are all uh, placed next to each other. We, we import sequential. And also uh, we use dense layers. Uh, and dense layers means that each neuron is connected to all neurons in the previous layer. This is the most common form of uh, layers in, in neural networks where all these neurons are connected without any specific uh, structure um, that, you know, is going to be used in some other um, neural networks. And therefore, the way that, again, we think about this is in terms of object-oriented programming. So we're going to start this sequential uh, model, which is actually a class, and we have to instantiate it, right? So it's a class, we instantiate it. So now we have this object, which is called model, which is basically nothing in it because you have not done anything yet. But we have to start to add layers. So in order to add layers, you just call model.add. So this means that you want to add a layer. And as we said, the layer that we want to use is a dense layer. And you can obviously look at the documentation page, like scikit-learn or other machine learning and data science libraries. That's the best thing to do. You can see full instruction about you know, what input parameters you can provide. But the most important one is the units, which is the number of neurons that we had in that hidden layer that I just showed you. And then the activation function, which is the nonlinear function that we have. And of course, you have more uh, options here if you want to initialize these uh, networks yourself and et cetera. So there are a few other advanced options, but as you can see here, the most important thing is this unit, which should be a positive integer, which is the number of uh, neurons that we have in that layer, and then the activation function. These two ones are definitely important and you should uh, look into them. Okay, so now let's go back to the notebook that we have. So in this case, we want to add the five uh, neurons that we have here. Something important to, to keep in mind is that for the first input layer, usually you do not need to explicitly add a layer. Once you add this hidden layer, you can mention that the dimension of the input is one. So this is telling uh, Keras that I want to have these five neurons. And in the previous layer, I only have one. If you have like, for example, like two, three, then you have to choose the right number here. 
and then the activation function. We're going to talk about what ELU means uh, in a little bit, but right now we know that we are, we are using some nonlinear function. And after this, we know that uh, we have only one more layer, which is the output layer, and has only one element in it. And therefore, we use model.add dense one. So in this case, you don't need to, anymore to use input dim because uh, Keras already knows that there are five uh, neurons in the previous layer. So that information is not needed anymore. So we're going to run this cell too. So one of the nice things about Keras is that it provides something known as model um, summary, uh, which gives you information about the model architecture. And um, this means that the number of layers in your model, their shapes, the total number of parameters or weights that you have to learn, et cetera. So you can see that here, if I run this model.summary, you get a lot of information. So this is telling us, and I have uh, copied that um, neural network that we want to implement here to show you the, the similarities or how you can interpret this. So you can see that it's telling us that we have five dimensional representation of the input data. And that makes sense because we have five neurons here. As I said, we don't usually do this explicitly for the first layer. So this is for the first hidden layer. And then after that, we have a layer. So that corresponds to this one, which has only one element. And this also counts the number of elements that we have. So the reason if you're wondering why here we have 10, whereas we, have, we are showing here only five weights or connections is that because very similar to linear and logistic regression, we also have the, the intercept or the bias terms. So all of these neurons that you can see in this hidden layer, they also have a constant that are coming to them. It is very common not to uh, plot those things to avoid any kind of like confusion here. Um, because it can get too complicated, but that's why here we really have like 10 parameters, whereas you see five. So you can, um, you know, in this case, multiply that by two. Uh, and in the other case that we have, uh, we have five weights here, and there's one extra constant coming to this. I can visualize that here. So that's like the other, like, bus term coming. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, six which matches the six that we have here. And if you're wondering what this none is here, so remember that, you know, anytime you use scikit-learn or Keras or TensorFlow, we want to have 2D arrays where the first dimension corresponds to the number of samples, right? That's the number of rows. And in this case, because we have not uh, provided any information about the number of samples, uh, Keras decides to use none, meaning that um, there is no value right now, but it's going to be, uh, this information will be given at some point. And this is completely, um, you know, uh, okay to use. You do not have to be uh, worried about that. So as long as these second dimensions are as expected, that's the only thing we really uh, care about here. So once you define your model, remember that for the model feeding or training, we need two things. We need to know the loss function, and we need to know how we want to minimize the loss function. The loss function that we use here is mean squared error, and this is the loss function that we use for linear regression. And for the optimization algorithm, we use something called ADAM, which stands for Adaptive Moment Estimation. Um, there are a bunch of optimization techniques or algorithms that you can use. This is kind of like beyond the scope of this course, but in this case, we use ADAM. Uh, you can also use like SGD or RMS prop. So if you go to the documentation of Keras, you can see a bunch of uh, different optimization algorithms, but for now we use this uh, atom. And once you compile your model, let's run this cell before I forget. Now this is the part that very similar to scikit-learn, you have a dot fit, which you provide your training data, X train and Y train. The only, I would say, main difference here is that also you have to provide the epochs, which means that the number of times that you want to pass through your data. So this uh, technique, um, like Adam, these are all based on an iterative optimization uh, technique, which uh, goes through the data multiple times. And in this case, this means that we want to go through the data, the entire data, 500 times. So usually if you increase this, 
you should get better results. Although there are some complications if you choose the number of epochs to be too large, but for now, just remember that this is something that you can adjust as you need. And here's the nice thing. So once you run this, you see a lot of useful information. You can see that the, this loss value, right? So that's the value of your loss function that you're trying to minimize. It is indeed actually decreasing, right? So you can see that it started from 2072 and it is indeed decreasing, right? Now it's going under 1,728. And, uh, you know, the number of epochs you can see here, like this is like iteration 111 out of 500 that we provided. So you can see that the error or the value of the loss function, which measured the disagreement between true and predicted values is indeed uh, getting closer and closer to zero, which is, you know, very much desirable. So let's see where we end up at the end if this is already done, which it is. Um, so you can see that we get to 85. So once you run this, you know, um, yourself, you may get a different result because, you know, there are several like, you know, um, you know, other uh, parameters or um, I would say factors that influence this uh, decay of the values of the loss function. But overall, you should see the same trend that you start from some value and it goes down. But very similar to scikit-learn, we also have a dot predict method, which now we can predict the outputs for these testing data points, the input testing data points. And then we can have two scatter plots to uh, visualize the testing data, both inputs and the true outputs, and then the inputs and the predicted outputs, the y pred that we just found here. And as you can see here, using this figure that we that we generated, uh, it seems that we are doing very well, right? So we had that um, original testing data points, the red circles, and then this green one is what we predict. And you can see that we can really uh, very nicely capture uh, the connection or the relationship between inputs and outputs here. Now you may ask, well, how uh, neural networks work or how do we train them? I mean, obviously we understand the, the main steps, which is defining the model, then compiling it, and then using model.fit. And once you do model.fit, you can use model.predict. But how does this uh, you know, work? So one of the most important things um, that we saw before when you want to solve uh, you know, these types of optimization problems is that we have to find the gradients, which uh, you know, these gradients extend the notion of derivatives to uh, to vector argument functions, right? So we had the example in linear regression where we had theta zero and theta one, and then we wanted to find the partial derivatives with respect to them and put them in a vector that we call gradient. So that's the exact same concept here, except that you probably have a, a lot of parameters that you have to find these partial derivatives. But the very nice thing is that these libraries such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, they come with something known as automatic differentiation or auto diff. Uh, and what this does is that they allow for the efficient computation of gradients and you do not have to solve this problem by hand or um, really worry about that. So that's something that you know, is implemented in the background. And the way that this is done, at least in TensorFlow, is using something called gradient tape, which is a mechanism that uh, watches the oper operations that executed inside its context. So in order to understand this, let's look at a very simple calculus um, example, right? So let's say you have two variables, x and y. You multiply x by two, and that gives you u another variable, right? So u is two times x. And then uh, you have another variable v, which is x plus y. And then these two, u and v, combine together by multiplying u by three and v by five, and give you, uh, this gives you this function f. So now if somebody asks you what's the partial derivative of f respect to x, that's a basic chain rule. Then you need to find partial derivative of f respect to u u with respect to x, and there's a second path, f with respect to v, and v with respect to x. 
And these individual partial derivatives are very simple, right? Because we know that f is three times u. So then the partial derivative of f with respect to u is just this value that you have here. And you can do the math. We can show that in this case, the partial derivative is L1. And the same thing with partial derivative of f with respect to y, you can see that it's five times one. So it's once you learn the logic, it's very simple, right? You need to find these paths and multiply these weights that you have. And that's sort of what gives you the partial derivative. And now you can put this together and that will be the gradient of f uh, with respect to this x and y. So let's implement the exact same thing using uh, TensorFlow's uh, gradient tape and see how that works. So again, we import TensorFlow as tf. We define the function f, which is three times u, five plus, plus five times v. And in this case, you have to define these constants in TensorFlow using tf.constant. So in this case, x, let's say is two, y is three, right? And then we use this tf.gradient tape. So you use a with statement, tf.gradient tape as tape. And in this case, you have to tell TensorFlow to watch for X and Y because you want to perform some operations on them. And this means that, well, see what operations are performed on them. So then you can find these partial derivatives, right? Because otherwise, if uh, TensorFlow doesn't keep track of these transformations or these uh, operations to get to the this function f, it cannot go backwards. So we need to make sure that TensorFlow is watching for you know what's happening to x and y, and then we're saying that well u is two times x, right, and v is x plus y, and that's exactly what we do, and then f is applied to u and v. And that's what the result is. So that's our gradient tape. And so once you do this, now you can say tape dot gradient. So that's how you find the gradient. You say that you want to find the gradient or partial derivative of result, the result of that here that we have this f with respect to x and with respect to y. And if you run this cell, you can see the result, right? This looks like magic. You find this 11 and five, the, the two results that we had here. So you can see that TensorFlow is very smart, knows calculus one and can find, uh, you know, uh, partial derivatives using chain rule. Uh, and, uh, you know, it provides a lot of functionality, especially when you want to find gradients in order to uh, solve the empirical risk minimization problem for model training. So now that we understand how this works, what we want to take this to the next step. Let's, uh, you know, define a simple linear regression model. This is we have done multiple times before. Uh, one time when we had object-oriented programming uh, practice, then we used the scikit-learns linear model. But you can actually use TensorFlow to solve a linear regression model. And the reason is that using this um, hidden layer actually here is not really necessary, right? So you can have a model that directly connects inputs to outputs and still use TensorFlow. So these libraries are very flexible and versatile. You don't have to necessarily use uh, hidden layers. So let's see how this works, right? And in here, we can really explain the concept of epoch. So that's like one of the main reasons that we are using this. So in this case, again, we import TensorFlow as TF, and we assume that this is our X uh, train and Y train, right? And the, the result here is kind of obvious that if the inputs are one, two, three, four, and the outputs are two, four, six, eight, then the weight that we have in linear regression is two, meaning that if you multiply the input by two, you get the output and there is no bias or y-intercept. But we want to actually see this in practice. So in order to do this, because this w, which is the slope here, is a variable and needs to be optimized, we use tf.variable and we're going to set that to be zero, right? So that's just an initial guess that we think that well, maybe the answer is zero, but we are going to actually, you know, now use an iterative process to make this actually a better bad. And then you need to define how this W translates to the output. So you need to uh, 
define a function called linear regression, which simply multiplies w and x, and then a mean squared error function, which measures this um, sum of the square of the differences between the predicted and true values, and then we find the mean, right? So here you can see I use some of these like TensorFlow functions because everything will be performed in the TensorFlow ecosystem. So it is better to use TensorFlow functions. So that's why you can see I use like tf dot square. But based on what we know, this is obvious that this is the means that we will uh, raise this to the power of two, right? Very similar to the way that you know we can use like a square. Uh, functions in other libraries. And tf dot reduce mean means that we want to find the mean or average. That's how we do the, uh, you know, we define the empirical uh, risk minimization problem. So now that we have these components, now we can actually write a training loop because remember these solvers that we have with neural networks that are um, iterative solvers. So remember in each epoch, what we do, we make predictions we calculate the loss function, and then we find the gradient of loss function with respect to the parameters, which here is just W. And then we have to update W in a way that it reduces the, the value of the loss function. And in order to do that, we use tf.gradient tape to be able to find the gradient. And once you find the gradient, the way that you can update this model parameter here, W, you just need to subtract what is known as um, the learning rate or a step size multiplied by the gradient, right? So this means that you already have a W and you have to subtract W by learning rate times gradient and update W. And in fact, in, in TensorFlow already, there is a method or function to do this, which is called assign sub. So this means that you're gonna find this and you do w minus this value, and you assign that value to w. So that's how you uh, adjust w to give you a better uh, sort of like value of the loss function. And here, better means that we want to reduce the value of the loss function. OK, so now that we want to write this um, training loop, in this case, I'm using learning rate of 0 0.01. It is common to use learning rates, um, you know, uh, very small values such as 0 0.01, 0 0.001. Um, you know, usually you don't want to choose like learning rates that are greater than one because, you know, in each step we want to move uh, slightly. We don't want to have huge jumps, right? Um, depends on the problem, but in most cases, learning rates should be in the order of, you know, 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 3. And in this case, because this is a very simple problem, I'm going to just use like, you know, 50 epochs. So now you write a for loop where for epoch in range of epochs, so this, this means that now for 50 times, what you want to do, you're going to use this with a statement to uh, record the forward pass, meaning that if you have W, I'm going to multiply that by the input feature to give the predicted value. That's the assumption behind linear regression because we do not have a hidden layer here. And then we measure the difference between the true and predicted value, and that's what our loss is. And so once you get out of this with a statement, you now you say that, well, tape.gradient, I want to find the gradient of loss with respect to W, and I call that gradient. And then you're going to update this W or weight or, uh, or, or, or W parameter here, or the coefficient, if you want to use the terminology for linear regression, and use this learning rate times gradient. And then we use an if statement that if the remainder of division of the epoch uh, by 10 is 0, then print the epoch number, the value of loss, and the value of this weight W. Right. So in this case, we know that the value of W at the end should be 2 because that's how we generated the data, right? So in this case, this W, if it's 2, then it's perfect, right? It matches the data. But we are going to start, actually, if you look at here, from 0. So the question is, if we start W to be 0 and do these updates, can we get close to 2, which is the optimal solution? 
So when we run this, okay, so we forgot to, to run the previous cell. That's why it's important to run all these cells. And if I come back here, this one is pretty fast because it's a very small problem. So you can see that at epoch zero, when we just started, last value was 30, because this was just again, like a really like, you know, a uh, bad choice at the beginning. But then as we go to, uh, you know, future ste steps or epochs, you can see that the value of loss function gets very close to zero. This is like 10 to the negative five. And then the weight is almost two, it's 1.997, right? So if we uh, really round this, this is, you know, uh, exactly two. And therefore this shows that yes, right, this, you know, approach, you know, is able to find the, the true answer. So let's see what happens if we use um, a very, very small learning rate, right? So we can repeat the exact same process. Let me run the previous cell two. So in this case, I'm using a very small learning rate. And you can see that in this case, um, we are still, the weight is very close to zero where we started, right? Because it takes a lot of time to get away from zero if the step size or learning rate is a small. But what if, let's again run this cell to use learning rate to be large, like 100 or something like that. So you can see that in this case, even we get like NAND, which means that not a number, right? And the problem is that even um, in epoch 10, the weight is one times almost 10 to the power of 35. It's extremely large number, right? Like we get to a point that we cannot even store these numbers. So therefore you wanna choose a learning rate, which is reasonable. So in this case, I use, you know, 0 0.01. I think that's a really good choice here. And you can see that once we run this, we get the result that we expected, right? So the weight is close to two and the loss function is close to zero. That's perfect. The last thing that we wanna talk about here is about the activation functions, the nonlinear functions that I said that they're going to be applied in each layer. And so there are multiple options, but the most popular ones are rectify linear unit or LU, uh, and it's known for its simplicity because it has this very nice formula. It's max of zero and X, which means that if X is negative, we always get zero. If X, X is positive, then we get X. So it's basically Y equals X line where you're going to, uh, for the negative values of X, you're gonna set everything to zero. We have a cell here that I'm gonna actually plot all these functions. We can you know, do this mathematically to plot all these functions, but this is a programming course. So we're gonna use NumPy and all other tools that we have such as matplotlib to, to plot these things and visualize them without going through mathematical details. So the problem, as we said, is that with ReLU for all the negative values of X, you know, we get zero and, and that's not ideal because you can have a dying ReLU problem which means that in many cases, your networks can produce a lot of zeros. And so ELU or exponential linear unit tries to fix this problem by changing the, the equation for the negative values of X, which is this alpha e to the X minus one. And alpha is what is known as a hyperparameter. It means that very similar to epochs, you have to set the value of this beforehand. It is common to use alpha equals one or some other values. And we're gonna see how that looks like. And then we have another activation function, which is soft plus. And soft plus um, is, has this, method, has this uh, formula, log of one plus e to the x. You can show that for large values of x, this is technically log of e to the x and log and exponential are inverse functions. So you get very similar to the y equals x uh, function. But obviously, you know, uh, this is, very much like a smooth approximation. To, to show you what this means, uh, let's plot these three functions, right? In, in, in Python, this is easy. You set some values for X, you define these functions, like ReLU is np.maximum of zero and X. For ELU, we use np.where, where if X is greater than or equal to zero is X, otherwise it's alpha. And I choose alpha equals one here because that's usually the, I think the default value in TensorFlow. 
and then self plus, which is log of one to the e to the x, and then we use uh, subplots. That's why you can see that why subplots are uh, very important in in Matplotly because sometimes you want to put things next to each other. And let me also make sure that the value of alpha is one. And if you plot this, so you can see that the one on the left that's ReLU. So we have y equals x for x squared and zero, and everything less than zero is always zero. But as we said, this is not ideal because we get a lot of zeros when we have negative inputs. And then for ELU, or exponential linear unit, we have exactly the same structure for x squared and zero, but for x less than zero, you get this uh, a small amount of negative values that they can pass through. And for soft plus, you can see that we have a smooth approximation of this ReLU. So this dotted uh, function here is the ReLU to just show the connection with that. And you can see that when X is large enough, for example, here more than like 2.5, it's exactly, you know, matches like Y equals X, it converges to that. But then for this area, uh, for example, between like negative 2.5 to 2.5 is much smoother. So you don't have this kind of like edge here. Uh, just to wrap up this uh, lecture, so remember that in Keras, the most common type of layer is a dense layer, which means that all the neurons are connected. That's what you usually want to do, especially if you do not work with like image or time series type data sets. And uh, in order to use that, you need to uh, import it from Keras the layers from this module where you have all sorts of layers. So you can go here and see actually different layers that are available. And then inside this, the most important argument that you have to provide is the number of units or the number of neurons. You also can provide the activation function. And if you do not provide the activation function, then uh, it is assumed to be a linear, which means that it's not you know, doing anything um, for, for the input. And then uh, we have different types of activation functions, as we said, ReLU, ELU, we also have the sigmoid activation function, and that's something we saw in the logistic regression where we have to use the sigmoid function. So we already have that implemented. So if you're using a binary classification problem for the last layer, you do want to add this sigmoid activation function to make sure that you get probabilities. And in this case, we are going to um, you know, use uh, Keras and neural networks for two of the data sets that we already have seen. One is California housing data set. Uh, and you're going to see that, you know, you're going to use um, the Keras sequential API. And very much like before, you're going to do train test split, model training, model prediction, and then the Wisconsin data set. So in this case, you know, you again want to kind of like practice working with different architectures. And here we have, uh, you know, all the sort of like instructions that you can define the function to create different models with the number of hidden layers, number of hidden units. And then you can write the for loop where for each combination you perform model training and you can see that how everything you learn in this course uh, can really be helpful to um, implement uh, neural networks and be able to perform uh, model selection. Thanks for watching.